Hello, everyone, and welcome to our penultimate webinar. We have one more tomorrow, and then that will be the end of the current series. Uh, for anyone who is joining just on audio, the slides for this have been uploaded onto the website, and you can download them straight from the link for today's event. It's not too big. The file is about three megs, uh, so that shouldn't take you long to pull down. The document that this presentation is based on is now open for comments, um, and we have a slightly technically restricted event today. Penny Boston, who is one of our presenters, is on a dodgy Wi-Fi connection, so unless we get a sudden improvement, uh, she will be in voice only, and Rory will be here in sound and video. Um, so the event is being recorded and will be placed on the internet, so everything you type and say will be out there in public. And with that, let's see if we can make this work. Penny. Okay, thanks uh, everybody. Sorry I can't be visible on the screen. Um, Rory, if you can advance slides for me as I go, I'll call for them as, as I need them. And uh, I'm afraid you'll also have to field any questions for us. And, and if it's something that I need to address, please let me know. Um, <clears throat> we felt during our face-to-face uh, -face meeting back in June that there was a really important need to focus on aspects of geophysics and the geophysical evolution of uh, terrestrial-type planets, whether they be uh, <clears throat> primary planets or even terrestrial-type uh, bodies um, circling uh, gas giants. And uh, even though Rory and I are, are neither of us experts in a lot of the areas that we felt were important, we wanted it to be included. And so um, several other people have assisted us in this. Kelsey Singer, who I believe is not able to participate today, uh, Polly Lane in Finland, um, and then most recently and very usefully, uh, Peter Driscoll, who happens to be uh, Rory Barnes's um, uh, postdoc. So uh, we are open and welcoming of additional uh, thoughts on this, obviously, as all the webinars have done, but particularly in this area, um, we have not had any real-life geophysicists <laughs> on, uh, on our group. Um, primarily, of course, these geophysical parameters are important for our consideration because of the consequences for astrobiology. So we have tried to uh, at least do the initial exercise of thinking through some of those uh, consequences. Rory, can you give me the next slide, please? So <clears throat> as with all of these, we have uh, tried to come up with uh, an explanation of what the title means and what the content is. Um, and then, of course, the justification. Uh, the explanation is uh, that the evolution geophysically of a, of a planet will be a major control on a lot of it, the other salient features, including its uh, climate and atmospheric composition uh, and even its uh, surface volatile inventory, uh, which is uh, critical as we think to astrobiology. Um, we are expecting from our um, forays so far into exoplanetary studies that there will be an enormous range um, of parameters that are relevant to the terrestrial planets um, that have Im strong implications, of course, for astrobiological concerns. And because, of course, astrobiology is expected to play out over long time periods on bodies, um, how long and what is the duration and what is the sequence of events for different kinds of planets over uh, the billions of years that we would expect them to be in existence and be potentially um, habitable areas for, uh, for life. And uh, the justification we have boiled down to a single sentence, trying to keep it succinct. Uh, understanding the geophysical evolution of the planets will allow us to understand critical aspects of potential habitability from a fundamental perspective. So this is really trying to get at um, what are the fundamental ingredients that geophysics brings to the table that feeds into this whole notion of habitability. Rory, can you advance to the next, please, for me? Um, <clears throat> we've tried to corral a number of uber questions, really, uh, to try to uh, give a framework for our thinking. Um, obviously, Earth itself is... Uh, the object about which we know uh, the most about is geophysics, and of course we have this as a model. Um, one of my own observations is that I have had um, 
very little success corralling uh, conventional Earth geophysicists <laughs> into thinking about radically different bodies and how the geophysics might work. Um, and so I think there is a lot of room for trying to encourage um, cross-connectivity between planetary scientists um, who work on other bodies and um, Earth-centered geophysicists as much as possible. Um, obviously, we are now in the era of comparative planetology, not just within our own solar system, uh, but this tremendous and increasing um, dance card of uh, planets of every description. And so this is a wonderful opportunity, albeit challenging, for uh, us to expand our thinking in that direction. Um, obviously, astrobiology is very interested in habitable zones um, around stars as they are classically defined in terms of uh, distance from uh, the primary star and what the nature of that star is, what stellar class it belongs to. Um, and, of course, we know that there are not only perhaps uh, Earth-like bodies, but uh, also planets that are Earth-like, but in radically different mass classes, both up and down from Earth's mass. Um, we believe that thought about rocky terrestrial moons that circle around gas giants and habitable zones are really important, and a whole other class of habitable zone. Uh, and what can be learned from super IOs or other similar um, uh, uh, bodies that are around other stars, and <clears throat> really what are the geophysical consequences uh, for planets around non-Sol class stars, and how does then uh, that feed into the astrobiological considerations? Can we go to the next slide, please? Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, I've advanced it, Penny, so I get maybe... Oh. Delay. Okay. All right. Thanks, Rory. Sorry. I can't see that, so <laughs> I have to hear. All right. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the fundamental uh, aspect of a lot of these bodies has to do with the various energy sources um, that create processes that go on on planets, and several of these are particularly salient, of course, to planetary <laughs> interiors. Um, we know that, of course, all bodies of any significant size um, uh, presumably were endowed with their initial accretionary heating. Uh, depending on the size of the body, of course, that accretionary heating uh, can persist for very long periods of time. Um, so that initial um, amount of, of heating is expected to be a common property of most bodies that are likely to be of astrobiological significance. We know that those bodies that are endowed um, with enough metallicity in their solar system to possess um, radiogenic elements um, of high atomic uh, mass are going to be also a major and long-term contributor to internal heating of the body. Uh, there is, of course, uh, complex geochemistry um, that goes on as a, uh, a body will... Uh, differentiate physically and chemically in its interior, and a lot of those reactions are um, exergonic and also provide internal heating. Um, of course, external factors are also important, including the uh, solar energy that a, a body does or does not possess, but that's perhaps less salient to a lot of these deep uh, geophysical processes. And of course, as we have seen in our own solar system, um, early on in our history, we had a very major impactor generated source of heat that certainly affected uh, the surfaces of many of the bodies. Um, the degree to which that penetrated the, uh, the surfaces of Earth and, and other bodies is still a subject for debate and, and study, but nevertheless, this is another, another source. Um, with bodies that are orbiting particularly around um, gas giants that are moons around those, um, resonances between the moons and the primary planets, of course, as we see on Io and, and Enceladus and et cetera, uh, are capable of providing a great deal of uh, tidal heating. And so these are the, uh, the primary mechanisms that we have at our disposal to think about these bodies from uh, the geophysical uh, position um, with respect to their fundamental properties. Okay, Rory, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Penny. 
So with that introduction, I wanted to spend a few slides just uh, discussing some of the uh, more recent results that are, are pertinent to the, today's discussion. And uh, one of the most fundamental things we might be interested in in a, in a terrestrial exoplanet would be its, its composition. And uh, there's actually been a fair amount of work that's been uh, tackled uh, lately. Um, a lot of it's been led by uh, Jade Bond, uh, now Jade Carter Bond. Uh, and this is uh, one of the, her first results that I'm showing here in, in this slide, uh, just some examples of it, really. And uh, in this study, what, uh, what Jade and her colleagues did is they tried to basically map the composition of the star uh, to the properties of a terrestrial planet that might have formed around it. So they, they basically they looked at the spectrum of the star, identified the, uh, the abundances of the elements inside the atmosphere of the, of the star, and they assumed then that the, uh, the planet, protoplanetary disk from which terrestrial planets would form uh, was composed of similar uh, elements. And then they worked out sort of the evolution of that planetary disk at early times and basically identified a, a condensation sequence, so to speak, of where different elements and molecules might lie in the protoplanetary disk. They then assumed that uh, the precursors to the terrestrial planet, we call them planetesimals, uh, were endowed with the local uh, composition of the uh, level composition of the uh, of the of the disk, and then they allowed gravity to take over and simulated just how uh, the accretion process would proceed. And at the end, when they had just a handful of, of terrestrial planets that were somewhat similar in size to the Earth, they then examined what uh, constituent planetesimals made up the entire planet at the end. And uh, there are a few different uh, possibilities that they found. And uh, just to, to sort of highlight some of them, um, if you look at this top panel up here, this is a, a case of a star that has this telephone number HD17051, which is a, a star that they found to have low, a low carbon to oxygen ratio uh, compared to our sun. And it, they argue, I think quite persuasively, that the C to O ratio is a, is a critical um, value as far as trying to understand the composition of, of planets because it sets the, uh, the, the chemistry in the disk um, early on. And uh, uh, just to point out here that the, uh, this is the Earth's composition here, and of course here's the, uh, the, the a key from which you can look for your favorite element. Um, so in this, in this system, HD17051, what they found is that the, the planets didn't look very similar to the Earth. And you might notice, for example, that there's a lot of white in a lot of these planets, and that is calcium. So this uh, low C to O ratio transformed the chemistry in the disk, and it then created planets that tended to be more uh, calcium-rich than the Earth, although there are a couple of examples that look quite a bit like the Earth. Uh, if I go to uh, another star that might host planets, or I think maybe it does, in fact, um, we see that this, this uh, star had uh, a similar C to O ratio as our sun, and as they ran their, their process forward, they found that, indeed, they formed planets that did look quite a bit like the, the Earth. You can see that the, each of these little disks here looks quite similar to the, uh, the, the, our model Earth. Uh, finally, they looked at uh, this a star that had a very large C to O, a relatively large C to O ratio, and what they found was that, in fact, you didn't get silicon-rich planets at all. You tended to get these planets that were mainly uh, carbon and iron. So you can see that these planets all are, are quite uh, quite black, meaning they have a lot of carbon. So these are very different worlds than we might imagine uh, from, from just in our solar system. And these, we don't know necessarily that the host star's properties do map in this way. There is Planet formation is a complicated process that we don't understand, and I know there's been uh, other uh, webinars on this series on that topic. But nonetheless, this, I think, kind of gives us a zeroth order uh, example or a cut of just what might be out there. And it's fascinating to think about just what are the geophysical implications of these different kinds of compositions. Uh, moving a little closer to home, I think there's an interesting feature of the Earth, and that is that the uh, Earth's inner core uh, solidified about a billion years ago. Uh, for the first several giga years of uh, the Earth's uh, evolution, we actually did not have a solid inner core. And this transformation uh, actually changed the geophysics and the, and the geodynamo of our Earth quite a bit. And uh, this is a figure that I've taken from, from Peter Driscoll. And uh, I guess I can move my arrow out of the way here. Um, and what he's plotted here is basically the uh, evolution of the magnetic moment of the Earth as a function of time. And 
initially there's a, a little bit of, of growth here and as just the earth is accreting, but then you see there is this long decrease in the uh in the power of our of our planet's magnetic field, and that's just because the earth is cooling, there's less energy around to drive the dynamo. But then something quite dramatic happens. In this case it happened about half a giga year ago when the inner core nucleated, it started to solidify and this com radically changed the uh, energy budget in our in our planet, and it dramatically increased the uh, the power of of our magnetic field. And I find this a fascinating feature of our planet that it looks as though the uh, about the lifetime of the sun is comparable to the time it took for an inner core to form. And whether or not this has any correlation with with habitability or not, I have no idea. But you know, I think this is an interesting observation, and it's a question that we need to think about as we as we look forward to uh, actually trying to model some of these terrestrial exoplanets. Moving on, uh, there's also uh, part of the energy uh, budget for, for planets, as, as Penny mentioned, is the radiogenic inventory. And we know pretty well what the Earth's current energy flux is, but we don't really know what the uh, distribution of, of energy sources is. We don't know necessarily how much energy from the Earth's interior is coming from radiogenic uh, elements, how much of it is coming from some of these other sources that Penny mentioned, like accretionary heat or you know core formation, these sorts of things. So in this uh, this figure that is in a paper submitted by uh, Patrick Young et al. to Astrobiology, uh, they looked at the uh, how can uh, radiogenic uh, heating vary on exoplanets. And in this case, uh, we were primarily interested in uh, higher levels of heat, uh, just assuming that the Earth maybe is not typical, or maybe the Earth is, is typical, but there can be outliers. What is sort of the range of possibilities out there? So, um, first of all, um, I've, there's this black curve here, which is labeled the Earth. Um, that is sort of a nominal model for the uh, radiogenic heating of the Earth, which uh, is labeled up here in terms of surface flux, the surface energy flux through the, uh, the surface of the Earth. That's how it's uh, being parameterized here. And so this Earth case is basically assuming that about 40% of the Earth's uh, energy, current energy, is coming from radioactive decay, and you can, you know, the, and we know from a geoneutrino experiments from around the world approximately what the proportions of the radiogenic elements are in, in the Earth. They're potassium, thorium, and uranium, and so we, these are uh, elements that we know their half-lives very well, and so we can actually project uh, forward and model backwards what we think the uh, energy production in the Earth is going to be. Um, I've presented this as watts per square meter of the surface flux. Uh, that's a bit of a, a hand-wavy argument there. I'm not assuming any sort of uh, thermal cooling in the interior. It's just as soon as uh, an atom would, or an, an isotope would decay, its energy is immediately at the surface. But it's sort of a zeroth order model for how the, uh, the, the planet might cool with time. Um, this uh, red curve here is a uh, a bit more of an extreme case as if we were to assume that the entire Earth's energy uh, is being produced by radiogenic heating, but with the same proportions of elements as we see today. This is almost assuredly not possible, um, but it's nonetheless sort of an interesting gauge. Maybe there's sort of a factor of a few, what might happen if uh, an, a planet had the exact same abundances of potassium, thorium, and uranium, but maybe increased by about a factor of two. Uh, one of the primary uh, elements in uh, the radiogenic uh, inventory of the Earth is uh, 40 potassium, uh, but potassium is a volatile, and the Earth is depleted quite significantly by a factor of maybe 25 or 30 in potassium relative to chondrites. And if if you were to add this uh, additional uh, source of energy to the Earth, you get a very different uh, uh, situation. So this is basically taking this black curve and now bumping up potassium by a factor of 25 or 30. So imagining it as if the Earth were actually made of chondrites uh, exclusively. And you can see then that the, uh, the, ed the energy evolution is quite, quite different. In fact, for about the first 2 billion years of evolution, we might expect the Earth to behave more like Io, which is shown here by this dashed line. So very different kind of world, very different evolution. How does this change the picture? Does that actually prevent habitability in plate tectonics, etc. And then finally this green curve is an even more extreme example where now I'm basically taking the, the red curve for assuming all the energy inside the Earth is uh, from radiogenic sources and then I'm making it not only just chondritic in abundance patterns but actually twice chondritic as far as the radiogenic elements are concerned. 
So this is, I don't know, maybe, maybe I was going to say it's a, an extreme example, maybe at the absolute upper limit, but maybe not. We don't really know what the distribution of, of radioactive isotopes in the galaxy is. We don't know how they can be, uh, how they are coalesced into planets. Do, do certain processes tend to favor or disfavor uh, the accretion of these elements into the Earth? So as we, we look forward to these terrestrial exoplanets, we're really going to have to think hard about just what really is the energy budget inside of these planets. And uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Penny. So go ahead. And like Penny. All right. Well, I'm temporarily back on the site. We'll see how long it lasts. Um, this uh, slide is uh, bringing up the issue of what is known as the RC to RP, which is the ratio between the core radius of a planet and the outer uh, diameter of that planet. And it's been pointed out that <clears throat> this may uh, be a significant factor in terms of what happens to an internal dynamo of a particular body. Um, it is not well understood. It's a figure that is uh, cited for a number of bodies. Um, so this is an arena of uh, research that has significance because there are uh, major consequences uh, in terms of uh, what happens with uh, an interior um, dynamo should a planet have one. Um, the generation, of course, of magnetic fields that we think comes from our own dynamo here, uh, producing magnetic field lines, are um, of great astrobiological significance because they serve as a buffer um, from whatever ionizing radiation is being produced by a particular star around which they may be orbiting. Uh, obviously, for certain uh, stellar classes, this is um, perhaps even more important than it is for our own sun. Um, red dwarfs, for example, are thought to uh, sporadically emit a very strong blasts of, um, of radiation of very, very di varying different characteristics. And so um, the magnetic protection of a potential astrobiological object uh, is really important. The interior differentiation, what actually goes on when the, uh, when the body is forming, has profound implications for what materials are then ultimately available uh, in the uh, more superficial areas of that planet that can actually go into um, creating life in the first place. Um, uh, differentiation and evolution of interiorly trapped volatiles, for example, um, solid solution equations that go on, and, and many other uh, fundamental things in terms of um, perhaps, perhaps even the depletion, for example, that uh, Rory was just mentioning um, for potassium, which is, uh, you know, in our own biology is a, a particularly significant element. Um, and then, really, this also speaks to what is the potential longevity of internal heating sources. Um, we all uh, pretty much agree that some aspect of a highly active uh, planetary interior where there is uh, built-in recycling mechanisms is probably pretty important for the longevity of a biosphere on any planet. And so uh, this feeds into, um, into those considerations. Um, we know that internal heat loss uh, from the inside of the body is occurring by conduction and by convection. And so contemplating what goes on here on our own planet um, and the behavior of the complex uh, uh, plate tectonics that we have um, is something to give us pause. How common are plate tectonics on planets? Um, it appears that we are uh, alone or a rare body within our own solar system in terms of the particular style of plate tectonics that we appear to have. There are obviously other extensional tectonics that go on on other bodies, for example, Europa, Ganymede, and so forth, and clearly Enceladus. Um, but we have very little um, real understanding of uh, what planetary regimes we are looking at where we would actually be able to set up something on that planet. Um, I have attempted to induce people to talk to me about the issue of whether or not we could expect, for example, on a, um, a significantly chunky uh, super-Earth, uh, would we actually get plate dynamics of the kinds that we have here? Would we get plates moving about? Would uh, the much larger mass, perhaps, um, really affect the behavior of the convection of the mantle and so forth? Um, people are not even very willing to even speculate about that. So 
this is something that has caught my attention. In general, people have suggested that the kind of relatively thin lithosphere um, that we have on Earth uh, in terms of the crustal material can produce uh, shallow convection and that these um, crunchy lithospheric slabs on top are uh, rapidly and continually created and consumed, and we see that here on this planet. Um, but then extending that beyond our case, um, even to expand, understanding tectonic regimes on other bodies in our solar system, and then extending that to classes of, uh, of bodies that we don't have here in our solar system, uh, we think is a really important thrust for research with uh, profound astrobiology consequences. I turn it back over to you, Lori. Sure, thanks. So uh, the next slide here, which looks to be a little bit modified somehow, uh, sorry about that, but uh, it's not quite what I put on here. But anyway, the point here is that now I want to think a little bit more about um, terrestrial exoplanets again in uh, the habitable zones and in particular thinking about uh, what other sources of energy are available in the tidal heating here. And, and more broadly, uh, looking at just how can we start to begin to classify these terrestrial exoplanets as we move forward uh, in trying to envision a way in which we can sort of sample the atmospheres of these exoplanets. We want to try and pick the planets that um, are the most likely to be, be habitable. Um, and this figure here is sort of meant to call sort of a warning to people that, you know, it's not necessarily going to be obvious that just because a planet is in the habitable zone that it is going to be potentially habitable because the geophysics can be quite important and quite dramatic. And uh, what this figure shows is uh, tidal heating from a, a rather simple model, uh, the, the, in fact, the model that predicted uh, volcanism on Io, um, how that tidal heating model will predict, um, what, what it would predict for the heating rates would be on, the, uh, on a planet in the uh, habitable zone of a nearby very low mass star, which is called VB10. Um, VB10 is sort of the uh, archetypal low mass star, star. It's right at the uh, hydrogen burning limit. It's about six parsecs away, so it's nearby, and it's something that will probably be astronomers are probably going to be targeting to uh, try and identify um, potentially habitable planets. So, uh, what I in this figure first notice uh, where it says habitable HZ that stands for habitable zone. So the habitable zone extends from this dashed line to the right. Um, now. Uh, the, the, the axis here are the orbital eccentricity and the orbital period. So we're not normally used to seeing habitable zone plots in this way. They're not, it's not the, uh, the stellar mass versus the distance, but it's slightly different. Uh, and uh, what I, but what I want to point out here is that the eccentricity is actually going to be very important as far as identifying planets that might be habitable or not. So let's first look down here at the bottom where it's purple and green. These are Sort of, this would sort of be our classic picture of the habitable zone, where interior to the habitable zone you have Venus-like planets, and in the habitable zone there are green planets. Um, the outer edge of the habitable zone is not shown. It's probably about here, though, at the end of this um, spurious green field right there. And uh, notice that the eccentricities down here, where the green region is, are very low, sort of 0 0.01, 0 0.02. This is similar to what the uh, the Earth's eccentricity is today. And But if we go any... Any, any larger than that, we're going to move into a very different kind of, of planet. This uh, blue region right here is what I like to call tidal Earths. This is where uh, the tidal energy in a side of planet is likely to be similar to what the Earth's current energy is today. So these would be planets that, uh, in the absence of any other sort of heating, would have the same energy as the Earth today. But, of course, they probably do have more energy sources. They have radiogenic heating and differentiation and things like that. So it's a very different kind of world. Um, tidal heating is most likely deposited near the surface of a planet. And so now you completely change the thermal profile of a planet if you have heat sources in a core and heat sources near the, near the lithosphere. And how does that change uh, a, planetary, a planet's evolution is, uh, is, a, is an unknown right now. We, we don't know if that really is going to suppress plate tectonics or geo, uh, the, the geodynamo, but I think there's things that we need to, need to be exploring uh, very soon to try and understand what might be going on on these planets. I mean, if you were to tell an astronomer that you found a planet right here at, the, at sort of the Earth-equivalent flux distance from its host star with an eccentricity of 0.02, they might be pretty excited, but we have to remember then that there's this tidal heating effect here, and in fact, at 0.02 is where we'd actually transition into what I would call a super IO. These are planets in which tidal heating from the star, I should say, tidal heating due to deformations caused by the star, um, will produce uh, um, energy fluxes on the surface that are larger than we see on IO. 
So these planets in the habitable zone of VB10 with an eccentricity of just 0.05, they don't look like the Earth. They are going to be planets like, uh, like Io. And then finally, which is what's dominating this figure is this red region, which is what I call tidal Venuses. This is where tidal heating is strong enough to actually trigger the runaway greenhouse, which nominally represents the inner edge of the habitable zone. So without any starlight at all, planets in the habitable zone that are, uh, that are marked red in this figure, um, they're not habitable. They are in a runaway greenhouse, and they are they're toast. Now, that's, of course, using a very simple model, though, and we don't really know how uh, tidal heating is going to behave on an exoplanet that is predicted to have two orders of magnitude more surface flux than on Io. So I find this to be a huge open question, and we really need to have new and improved geophysical models that explore the relationship between tidal heating, composition, and other sources of energy if we're to understand the potential for identifying habitable planets around low-mass stars. And now it's back to Penny. Okay. Thanks, Rory. Um, the issue of um, gravity on a planet, how much it has of that, is a uh, fundamental and really critical, uh, critically important uh, arena. Because we have focused for many decades on um, uh, space flight, there have been many more studies on hypogravity, microgravity, no gravity, and so forth than uh, have occurred uh, in the other direction with uh, some sort of simulation or consideration of hypergravity. But as we begin to see um, these much uh, larger than Earth rocky terrestrials appear to be creeping into our list of exoplanets, um, it's time to begin to consider what that kind of environment might be like for, uh, for organisms. And, of course, this is a very difficult thing to do. It's much easier for us to even experimentally produce uh, hypogravity, and that has been done, of course, in uh, the space station and space shuttle and other spacecraft. Uh, we can also uh, do that with hyperbolic uh, short-term experiments on Earth. Um, simulating hypergravity is somewhat more difficult. Um, but there are specific geophysical considerations that go into creating whatever the gravitational value is for a body. And the consequences of those um, are really important. So we have already discussed this whole issue of tectonics. Um, what does a uh, planet with a very different mass number and perhaps different density um, do to uh, the potential for tectonic mixing of materials over time? Um, can we even produce things like mountains uh, above a terrestrial value that is close to our own? Um, what does a much uh, greater gravitational field do uh, to weather patterns and thus the, uh, the climate of a, of a given body? So these are all primary things that can be considered in geophysical terms. Of course, the consequences for any life forms on such bodies uh, has to do with just about everything. Uh, certainly, any effects on the hydrology, the hydrological cycle on the planet, uh, whether it's water, as we think is currently important, or perhaps more exotic um, uh, solvents, um, there are undoubtedly going to be major differences in the way uh, geological materials will weather um, in response to uh, different uh, energetic uh, nature of weathering patterns and weather uh, systems. Um, one of the things that is a concept within ecology here on our planet is known as the critical zone. And um, if you're not familiar with the term, it really tries to capture the essence of this rather thin part of our own planet that is where we, the organisms who live here, um, inhabit and where all of the um, relatively rapid and, and perhaps even longer scale um, processes, turnover um, uh, processes that occur here that impact on the creation and sustenance of a biosphere are actually going on and extends from perhaps uh, a few uh, tens of kilometers within the crust up into uh, perhaps the upper stratosphere. This is sort of the hot zone, if you will, where, um, where life processes are, are meeting nose-to-nose -nose with the, uh, the geophysics, the geochemistry, and the atmospheric chemistry of, of the planet. 
And then there is the simple question of the effect on organisms of the gravitational uh, field itself. Um, in some recent work that we're uh, doing in my lab, we're trying to look at hypergravity simulations as a kind of a test case. And this is a very small project in, involving a couple of undergraduates doing their senior theses on this. But this is an arena in which we have not really given much consideration to these uh, these kinds of issues. So this really critical interaction of gravity with life is uh, is another arena that we uh, that we think uh, should be folded into the uh, the research balance. So this brings us to the last couple of slides where we um, have attempted to um, collect some of our thinking. This is not meant to be. Um, it's only meant to be illustrative. It's certainly not exhaustive. And we welcome input from uh, others, including those who are who are uh, tuned into this webinar and beyond. Um, so if you happen to have a pet geophysicist around, I would suggest that you try to corral him or her for their thinking. Um, obviously, fundamentally focusing on how the Earth works that has implications for applying that to other planets, and we show a few examples here. Uh, plate tectonics, how does the carbon cycle uh, operate, what is the balance between uh, solid phases of the planet and liquid phases, um, how has Earth gone from its original very different state uh, through all of the different um, geological epochs, when did plate tectonics turn on, this is quite controversial, um, what is the balance of the course of internal heating, um, what can we then take of our understanding of Earth and the way we apply it to the solar system. Um, we have this long conundrum, uh, the three bears problem between Earth, Venus, and Mars, and their, their different histories, how different were their additional, uh, their uh, initial, rather, endowments of materials. Um, why doesn't Venus have a magnetic field when we do, even though um, Venus is very close to us in mass? Um, and the others... Um, can we get true tectonics on icy satellites? And, I, I, and we've mentioned that before very briefly. What about these um, exotic beasts that we have roaming about other stars? Um, super Ios, as, uh, as uh, Rory has mentioned them. I think of Exo Enceladuses and all of these other different examples that we can extend um, beyond our own system. Um, if these objects are, are outgassing, can we actually observe those volcanic species? Can we actually detect whether or not there are volcanic processes going on on another uh, body around a distant star by looking at the atmosphere and chemistry? Um, there has been one attempt in the literature uh, that I will not cite here. Uh, it was a noble attempt, uh, but apparently uh, the authors never actually talked to a real live volcanologist. Um, so it was a, an early primitive attempt, um, but I think we can do better if we if we cross those disciplinary lines. Are there uh, proxies for the planets in the habitable zone uh, that we can use in order to do, uh, make an assessment of how habitable those planets are? Um, can we distinguish uh, between an evaporated and this is uh, this is Rory's term for this? That means um, a rocky terrestrial that is essentially a core of a planet that was perhaps a gas giant or a Neptune-class planet earlier on in its history, can we distinguish those uh, from uh, bodies like we presume Earth to be, which is um, uh, a rocky terrestrial right from the beginning? And then lastly, this category of uh, really what are the geophysical properties of planets in these exoplanetary habitable zones as we define them uh, on their basis of their stellar properties that may have consequences for astrobiology. Um, what is the fundamental chemistry? Um, how does the balance between being carbonator, silicate-dominated body really depend on the properties of the actual disk and solar system formation? Um, how do metallic silicates um, affect the evolution of super-Earths? Can you have um, metallic silicate poor bodies in the same mass class that behave very differently, uh, we presume so. Uh, for very low mass stars, which account for about 75% of all stars in our galaxy, how do uh, processes like tidal heating affect the interiors? Uh, can they even 
uh, develop a dynamo if they are locked in synchronous rotation, which is a scenario that has been painted for the habitable zone around these low-mass stars um, because of their, their relatively low luminance. The habitable zone is thought to be very close in to the star itself, which would lead perhaps to um, synchronous locking uh, of the body. Uh, here again, this same issue comes up again with radiogenic heating. Um, and can we actually classify planets really based on their setting? That is, what their properties uh, are in the context of their planetary system itself. Um, Hysteresis is important, and, and we have captured that in this one item. How important is the history for the current properties? How much system memory um, actually exists in any one of these um, planets? And does that matter, or um, are initial conditions um, perhaps really more important than uh, what actually goes on in the history of that planet? We really don't have much of a clue, and in fact, we, this is a, uh, an arena of debate within our own world here on Earth. Um, does the stellar composition, the degree of metallicity that it, that it may have, um, really indicate what kind of planets were being created in that system? And can we look at stellar composition, even in the case perhaps of where we have not yet detected uh, other planetary bodies, and can we infer something about the likely distribution of materials within those planets? Um, how do these so-called water worlds, which tend to be um, things like Neptune or sub-Neptune class planets that are relatively close in uh, to their primary star and where we are inferring that they have a huge volatile endowment, liquid water, perhaps is the only surface material. How do their interiors operate? How big are those interiors? We know nothing. Um, and then our last little point is how do very dry but still habitable planet interiors operate? Um, there has been discussion, of course, of the... Um, the relative desiccation of Mars is be, perhaps being one factor, uh, as well as its size, uh, that may have limited its future as a tectonic planet and perhaps uh, contributed to shutting down of tectonics early on in its history, precluding them altogether. So um, this is another important area of research um, to which little attention is being given. So uh, with that, I uh, conclude the formal slides that we have um, produced for this and throw this open to any questions or comments. And we'd like to reemphasize again that we're very open to additions from people who know more than we do about a lot of these uh, these arenas. And Roy, did you uh, want to make any last comments here? No, I don't think so, but I do, I guess, other than to just reiterate what you just said, you know, Penny and I are not geophysicists, and I think that I would encourage everybody, if you know a geophysicist, talk to them, try to convince them that this is, is worthwhile. I mean, there's a lot of astronomers like myself who are very interested in these uh, kinds of topics. And, you know, most of the Earth scientists that I know are very interested in the Earth because, as we've outlined here today, we don't really understand the Earth very well. And I think that there's a double-edged sword there and that that means there's a lot of fascinating processes to work on, but it also means that they don't really want to... Uh, try and tackle on these exoplanets that we know absolutely nothing about when we have all this great data for the Earth and we still don't know what's, what's going on here. But I sort of see this as a journey of a thousand steps is beginning here, and we need to really start finding a way to bring our geophysical colleagues into this problem because it's, it's really crucial. Life lives on planets, and we need to know what's going on in their interiors. So it's be kind to geophysicist day. Um, so now, I, I know the... Paulie often has uh, connectivity difficulties, so he may choose to type things in the text box, but at this point, the phone lines are open. They're all tied together. So if there are questions that people would like to raise or comments, now is a great time to do it. Um, and while you, would, um, while you were thinking about that, uh, let me just emphasize that the document is open for commenting now. Uh, and just in case you're not familiar with it, uh, you can get the document right from the front of the Astrobiology Future website. It's the top link on that. And just click on that, and that will take you through to the Google Doc itself. If you have a Google account, we do ask you to log in first. 
because that allows us to see your name attached to your comments. If you don't have a Google account, then if you're adding comments, could you just uh, add your name as well so that the authors can follow up with you if that's uh, a useful thing for them to do. So questions, comments, and ideas. Yeah, um, this is Brad Foley. I'm a new postdoc at DTM. I'm sitting here with Alicia Weinberger. And I'm one of the geophysicists that you're begging people to grab and bring into this. So Yay! I, I <laughs> we found and, them. Uh, so you also, in my, I also know Peter Driscoll very well, because we overlapped. So I was a PhD student at Yale while he was doing his postdoc there. But, um, you know, I've been interested in things like in plate tectonics and how plate tectonics forms from mantle convection. And, you know, we do actually, you know, a few, a number of people in the geodynamics community have looked at um, super earths and whether they'd have plate tectonics. And it, it, there's no one answer because there's so much we don't know. But, you know, I just can let you guys know that people like us have looked at that. And, uh, you know, we're, I'm certainly interested in working on this more with you guys, talking more about this with you guys. Well, that would be great. Um, Brad, if you um, are interested in contributing to the document, we would welcome input um, because you also um, are probably much more familiar with some of the relevant literature than we are. We can add some references and so forth, but um, one of the things that, that I would really encourage is, you know, those of your colleagues and you who are interested in doing this work and perhaps doing this work, it is not penetrating the astrobiology community. <laughs> and this is, you know, a whole additional constituency for your work that um, is out here and is anxious to hear uh, what you guys are thinking about this. So um, if you would like to contribute uh, hopefully not a whole lot of uh, work on your part, but we would welcome you as an additional author um, on the formal white paper. Sure, yeah, I can definitely tell with that. Other, any other questions or comments that people want to raise at this time? Okay, uh, in that case, uh, let me thank our presenters very much, uh, and Penny particularly for struggling with the technical <laughs> difficulties. We appreciate the fact you made it through on this. Um, and this video will be up on the website in the next day or so. Uh, so if you think you have colleagues who should see the presentation, or you want to just review anything that was said prior to adding your comments to the document, uh, it will be linked directly from the event link on the front uh, page <laughs> on the website. And apart from that, thank you very much, Marie, Penny, Cheriana. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.